Hello, thank you very much for being here. I'd also like to thank our speaker today, Raj Singh, who is Associate Professor at LSU. And uh, take it away, Raj, thank you so much. Hi folks, good afternoon. Um, it's two o'clock at Central Eastern Time, Central Time, not Eastern Time. And um, I'm recording this from my house. So if you see any, any kids uh, in the background, please, uh, I apologize for that. I'm trying to keep them quiet, but uh, sometimes it doesn't work. But anyways, um, this afternoon, I'm going to discuss some of the, the new and existing um, facts of boxwood dieback a new disease of boxwood in the United States. And I, I believe you have seen this problem in your nurseries uh, as well as anywhere else in the United States. I just wanted to give you a brief update on what we know about this disease so far. Um, again, this is a boxwood dieback. So uh, we have seen it on the boxwood so far. I, I have not tested or I have not seen the same kind of symptoms, the same pathogen on any other closely related um, host, host plants um, like Pachycendra or the Ilex, the Holly species. So for now, we are just going to talk about boxwoods. The causal agent is, a, is called Caltotricum theobromicola. I know it's a long name. Sometimes I, 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 I can't even say some of these uh, names. Um, so, but remember it's Caltotricum theobromicola. Um, when we first started working with this disease, uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, when we, the, I, I call it a new disease, but I think in my opinion, my personal professional opinion, I think this disease was out there and it was misdiagnosed because it produces symptoms. And I'll show you later in my slides how the symptoms are produced and what kind of symptoms you will see in the box words. Um, and because of those symptoms, I believe that it has been in our nursery production or in our landscapes for a long time, um, but it was misdiagnosed and it was the symptoms were attributed to boxwood uh, phytophthora root rot um, or the boxwood volatile blight. So uh, again, new disease because it has never been reported before. That's why I'm calling it new disease. It was first reported in uh, Louisiana, New York, New York, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina uh, in 2015. But the whole ordeal about this disease started back in 2011. Um, I run the Plant Diagnostic Center at LSU Ag Center. So we received samples, uh, commercial samples from landscapers. Uh, and this was a boxwood sample. It was a Japanese boxwood. Um, and the symptoms, the, so the landscaper brought me some symptomatic tissue, not the whole plant, just the symptomatic twigs. Uh, and when we looked at it, they look very similar to what a Phytophthora root rot will cause symptoms, similar symptoms. Um, so the preliminary diagnosis is based on just the, the sample. Usually we don't do that, but we were suspecting Phytophthora uh, from that. So we asked them to submit root and soil sample from the same infected plant. And once we received that, we tried several times and none of our attempts generated or yield any Phytophthora pathogen. Um, we received another similar sample and we were, we had, we were in the same boat. We didn't, we, we were not, una we were unable to isolate or detect Phytophthora. We, we tried all our different diagnostic methods just to isolated from, and we are very, very good with isolating Phytophthora from the root tissue. But in this case, we were not getting any success. So finally, I decided to uh, tell the client that we were unable to uh, detect or recover Phytophthora, but the symptoms look very uh, typical of the Phytophthora root rot. But we didn't, we didn't confirm the diagnosis and um, and we were done with the reporting, but after about two months from the from that uh, incident, we were again contacted by the same landscaper, and the landscaper was at a point where he was going to lose his contract with that church. Um, so that's when we, all the curiosity started, and I made a site visit and 
I wanted to look what's going on. And he was telling me the symptoms were spreading. So I made a site visit and went there and looked at some of the plants. These plants were really old. And I'll show you the pictures of the original plants that we, where we detected it. Um, they were older, um, no soil compaction, no root rot, no water drainage issues, but the symptoms were typical of what a Phytophthora root rot will cause. So I'll show you the symptoms. So again, collected several samples, brought them back to the lab, tried to again identify Phytophthora from it. We couldn't do it. Then I started looking at the upper canopy and starting just trying to scrape everything off and and then I noticed that there is some black discoloration up in, up in the canopy. And I'll show you that too. So, so far we have Japanese, Korean, English, baby gem and other hybrids uh, that are, that we have detected for, uh, boxwood dieback pathogen from. The symptoms resemble, as I mentioned, volatile blight, macrophoma blight and pachycendra and phytophthora root rot. The symptoms do not resemble the boxwood blight, okay? which is the, the box blight, the slendro, slendrocladium pathogen. Yeah, I think the name is now changed, but it's called boxwood blight, so it doesn't resemble those symptoms. Yeah. Uh, so far, it's present in nurseries and landscapes, and we have seen it in the liners too. Uh, when we first uh, came in, uh, when we first detected this disease, it was mostly fol foliar uh, transmission, but now we know that there is some root transmission going on, and I'll tell you that more about that. So this is the original plant that we tested in 2011, and you can see these are older plants. If you look at the crown, um, that's a that's an old that's that's that looks really thick. These are new, not new plantings. Um, and when I try to pull it out, it was not easy to be pulled out. I have to dig it out. Uh, and that's the first indication with for, with the Phytophthora root rot that if you try to pull it out, the roots are rotting and you should be able to easily pull it out. And here is a, a wider uh, picture of that where you're seeing several plants and in the background you can also see uh, the, there's random dieback. It's not uniform, so that tells you it's not a disorder. It's very random, uh, only some plants are infected, some plants in the middle, they are doing fine, okay? And some of them you see some empty spots because the landscaper who was taking care of it was just removing the dead tissue. And that's another problem. That other, this also tells you that this is a systemic disease. It's not a localized disease. Um, in the case of localized disease, if you have that twig dieback, you can just definitely remove it. And then um, not maybe in the boxwoods because the, the growth habit of boxwood doesn't, doesn't recover over here and you end up having an empty hole uh, in, in, that, uh, in that hedge. So here, if you look at the roots, the roots look fine and you can say this is a really good root ball uh, and see how uh, it's not compaction and no soil drainage, no water issues, nothing like that. These are on raised beds and there was no water standing uh, in the beds or anything like that. And these were on irrigation too. So there's no drought stress. Uh, roots didn't, didn't have any rotting at all. The roots were healthy as they can be, uh, but the symptoms, you can see the symptoms are very uh, prominent on all, the, all of these. So um, again, once we didn't find anything from the, from the root area or the crown or anywhere uh, in the center, we went up in the canopy. And this is one of the, the picture on, your, on my left-hand side is a picture from one of those original samples, original plants, where we start seeing that there is some kind of discoloration going up in the, in the, in the canopy under the bark, okay? So this was our first diagnostic, first diagnostic uh, symptom, where if you start seeing some of the, the dieback, what you want to do is you don't want to do it on the totally dead twig. You want to do it on maybe the second twig or the next twig to that dead twig where you can just take a sharp knife and scrape, take the bark off of it and you will start seeing that black discoloration. Now, keep in mind that this, this discoloration is very bright black. So it looks like the tissue is still living, okay? It's not dead as compared to your dieback, as compared to your discoloration caused by phytophthora at the crown area. Now, this is something new that we encountered, okay? This is, um, Early this year, um, 
another landscape where I was called in to see the plants were dying. Um, and here you can see, if I can take my, so here you can see this is a crown, okay? And you can see similar kind of that, the discoloration, bright black discoloration in the lower part of the crown. And that was kind of new to us because before we didn't see that in any of the boxwood that were infected with the boxwood dieback. So from the same uh, from the same crown, here is another good. Um, if you have a good hand lens, what you can do is you can look uh, look closely on it, and you will see some of these like black pustules. Okay, the bark is kind of like open up, and if you see that and do the same thing, I just put a, like a, a distant shot on here. I want to show you where the scale is. Um, so this is the same distance shot of this image, okay? Once you scrape it off, you can start seeing the black, bright discoloration and the green tissue area, which is still healthy, okay? So if you see something like this, you definitely have boxwood dieback. And this is just a confirmation that once you scrape it off, remove the bark back, you will start seeing this bright black discoloration up in the canopy, okay? And these are actually the spore producing bodies in pathology, we call them a servilus, but these are kind of like a cup-shaped um, fruiting body that will emerge from the infected plant tissue and will rupture the bark. And in this area, after some time, you will start seeing the spores are being produced. So if you do a transfer section of the, of the uh, twig that had the black discoloration, you can see how this is all the way extended towards the center of that woody tissue. Now, this doesn't make any difference because the discoloration is around here where the vascular bundles are. And that is why the plant is kind of tan colored, uh, wilted tan colored because the, it interrupts the water supply and nutrient supply. So the, the, the canopy is not growing anymore. But this is another, this is another uh, diagnostic feature that the black discoloration is not superficial. It goes all the way uh, it kills the woody tissue as well. Uh, so this picture comes from Alabama in the nursery where you can see these are all liners. And you can see some of the liners, they're doing fine. But then you start seeing this tan colored foliage and some of these liners are just all dead. Okay, So this is another indication that uh, it's already in the liner. So if you are propagating any, um, any material in your nursery from older mother plants, you have to be really careful that those mother plants are disease free, they don't have any symptoms at all. Otherwise you may end up having similar kind of uh, um, similar situation. And this also applies to if you get any liners from outside, uh, outside source, you have to be really careful uh, bringing them to your nursery and adding them to your production blocks. In the nursery, this is uh, again, something new that we encountered last year. We always thought that this disease symptoms uh, uh, start with the tan colored foliage, but that's not the case anymore. This is a three gallon baby gem um, from a nursery here in Louisiana. And you can see in the middle, uh, this whole section is kind of off colored compared to the rest of the plant. So once we start looking at this, then we look in the, the twigs in the lower part, right, right here, this is the picture taken from here, over here, you start seeing the black discoloration, okay? I didn't want to damage this. I didn't want to cause more stress to this plant. So that's why I didn't, it doesn't show whole, I didn't want to um, make an, another injury or a wound here to stress it out because I wanted to keep it in the nursery in, in my greenhouse and see how it spreads to the, to the rest of the, rest of the, um, this uh, baby jam box word. But you can see some of the symptoms right here where you see one single twig showing that tan colored foliage and rest of is kind of off color. Um, so far, I haven't seen where this pathogen will cause wilting of the, of the leaves. And I think the reason is that it starts on one end, if I go back, is it starts on one end and then it girdles the entire stem later on, but it takes time to do that. Uh, another good example, this baby gem, these were uh, planted in the green in, in the landscape, uh, six months old. 
Um, and within three months, they start producing the symptoms. And you can see random dieback, uh, very random in the hedge. Uh, and these were the baby gem. And this was one of the uh, house, um, brand new house where they had, oh my goodness, little over 3,000 baby gems all around the house. And when I looked at the price, each were like at the, not the wholesale, but most of these baby gems, they were, they were priced at $20 a piece, okay? Uh, and these were not readily available. So you have to go through a, a, a middleman or a broker, a broker to get those. Um, and if you do the math, that's what, 6,000 times 20, that's $12,000 right there. Or uh, no, what? Um, is it 12? No, six times 20. 6,000, uh, 3,000, no, 300 times 20, yes, 6,000, um, 6,000 uh, dollars. Um, so it's it's a big investment in some of the, and especially in Louisiana, what we're seeing that all the new subdivisions, all the new commercial uh, landscapes, um, town centers, uh, uh, strip malls, they have box words, okay? Um, this is the most popular ornamental plant that we have here in Louisiana. And I can understand because this is not a, a high-end uh, maintenance. All you have to do is fertilize and prune and keep it maintained or something like that. But that's not the case anymore. We are seeing more and more uh, plant dying in the landscape and also in commercial as well as in the home gardens. So this is the this is one of the, another house uh, again a big house and you can see how boxwoods are planted everywhere. Okay, and um, we have visited this twice and uh, we were very confident that um, this is boxwood dieback. And uh, so just to give you more idea. These are the spore producing structures or the servulus, okay? That will produce the spores. And those spores are transmit, transferred from, health, from disease to healthy plants by either pruning or irrigation water or anything like that. So you can also see the CT, which is another diagnostic feature of this fungus. Uh, other species of Colthotricum will produce that this CT but if you see something like boxwood having similar kind of symptoms and you have a, a microscope or a good hand lens, you can definitely see these structures where you have a, the fruiting bodies uh, emerge through the bark and then producing those CD. And then on top of that, if you, have, if you can make a good moist chamber out of this tissue, you can see it produces the spores, which are kind of sticky in nature. When I say sticky in nature, that also uh, affects the epidemiology or spread of this disease because when you, if, if you have a, a landscaper that comes in with a uh, gas powered shearer or gas powered uh, pruning tool, you can easily come in here. If I can see my arrow, where did it go? So you can easily come in here and you start pruning this top end. And if this is happening, if the spores are being produced, you can easily pick up those spores on your pruning tools and you can spread it. And this is what happened in this landscape. I don't have the entire picture of this, but everywhere you looked at the plants look same, okay? So this is one of them where the landscapers are maintaining it and they are pruning it with the electric or the gas powered shear or pruning tools where it's spreading at a much faster rate. And especially some of the irrigation water, if you are, uh, sprinkler irrigation or overhead irrigation, these spores can dislodge and then spread by splashing water or even with the splashing rain water. This is what we learned something new this year. Um, another landscape where the previous two infected, these are the stumps from the previous one that were infected and they were removed, but the stumps remain behind so we were curious to see what's, what's present in this area where those plants were removed. And when we checked the two plants on these sides of, of those inf infected ones or removed ones, you can see there is some symptoms here, very few, and then some symptoms here, okay? Now, again, 
those symptoms can be misleading because of uh, volatile blight or macrophomolite. So we looked at the, the canopy and the, we started looking at the, the crown and everything. And when we looked at the crown, here's the inset picture where you see the discoloration. Again, this is bright black discoloration compared to your phytophthora root rot. And in case of if you have this much discoloration uh, with phytophthora, the plant won't be surviving. And we were surprised to see that this whole crown is discolored. And if this crown was this discolored, you should definitely see this entire section dying. But that was not the case, okay? So what we did here, we took these two out, okay? Brought them to the lab. We wanted to see if the roots have something to do with it. And that proved our hypothesis that there might be some root transmission going on. Now, we still don't know if it can stay in the soil. I have not, I do not know if there is any Calthotricum species that will stay in the, in the soil in the absence of the host. I'm not sure, but we can find, definitely find that out. But when we looked at these two stumps that are in the picture, and we tried to, we brought them to the lab, and this is what we found. We looked under the microscope and you can see the same fruiting body with CD. And in the inset, you can see a good picture. Those are the black CD. And this is the surface of that root from one of those stumps. And you can see there are some spores, the shiny structures, those are the spores produced by it. So even they were, even the canopy was removed um, about a year ago, there were still kind of the roots were still there and this was an active source of the inoculum where it can go to the nearby healthy roots. And then we did some little more research on it. And so what we did when we took this out, we wanted to see how far the calthotricum will go down to the, to the roots. So this is the from the upper stem, the picture that I just showed you where the discoloration was. So definitely we had Galtotricum isolated from it. This is the crown where the soil line was. So right there, we wanted to test if it's in the crown too. So we tested that again. And all these results were uh, confirmed with the di molecular diagnostic method. And then we looked at the roots, okay? These were from the crown up to two inches in the, under the soil. And we were able to uh, culture it out and then two to four inches down. So after that four to six inches, we couldn't do anything because there was a lot of saprophytes growing on it. But this also gives you a little more information on that it also survives in the roots, okay? If you look at from up to four inches, that's almost like close to half a feet. And, and that can stay there for a long time and if, the box words, if you, so let's say if you have, um, if you try to plant another box word in the same area and you didn't, don't remove this one, there is a very good uh, probability that the pathogen can move from the previous one infected to the new healthy one. Um, earlier I was saying that it wasn't, it's not a root rot path, it's not a root or a swell bond pathogen, but after this evidence, I have to, I have to start looking it into if it is there is any root transmission going on. And we are going to do some experiments in the greenhouse to see if there is any root transmission uh, in, the, in the liners. So um, now in the landscape or in the nursery, it can vary from how much time does it take to produce the symptoms. This is the preliminary study that we, when we first uh, um, confirmed the disease, uh, you got four box words in front of you. Um, and we have two on the left that were inoculated, artificially inoculated with the pathogen and two that were not inoculated, but we made the wounds because we wanted to see if the wound and the main stem may cause similar kind of symptoms. So we made a wound here, okay? We took a, a scalpel and we made like, uh, we removed about an inch of the bark here. Okay, about an inch of the bark. And then over here, we put just a normal agar medium and then we parafilm it. In this case, we did the same thing, but then we put the inoculum, the, the pathogen in here. And you can see after six weeks, you start seeing 
some symptoms where the leaves are off colored. Again, there was not a lot of kind of wilting like that you will see in Phytophthora root rod, but off colored was uh, eventually there, okay? Um, then again, I'm glad I took these pictures because I was not um, confident enough these symptoms are produced by, uh, by our pathogen. So I started taking the bark off. So this is the bark from the one uh, that was inoculated. And this was the bark from the one that was non-inoculated control. And you can see there is no discoloration at all. And that pathogen produced the discoloration where it was inoculated. And then you can see the symptoms and there were no symptoms. So our wound inoculation worked. I tried the, another inoculation method where it was just sprayed. The plants were kind of prone before spraying. Um, and then we sprayed with the inoculum, it didn't work. But this was the, um, the method that we, we uh, invented a wound inoculation with boxwoods uh, and it worked. So after about 11 weeks, you see the symptoms, okay? uh, very typical of what we have seen it. And this is on the plants, the five plants on the right, um, they are our control plants. Okay, and these are our inoculated plants. So this tells that, confirms that the pathogen is actually a true pathogen and causes the boxwood dieback symptoms on the boxwoods. Um, now, accurate identification, why it is so important. There are two pictures, one at the top and one in the bottom. I'm sure you, by now you know this is boxwood dieback. Well, what, what's about, what about this picture? Okay. The symptoms are very similar to what you are seeing random dieback, it's not uniform on all the plants. This plant is kind of totally gone. This is still, um, so it resembles what you see in the bottom picture, right? Uh, but the top picture is a root rot pathogen called Phytophthora, okay? So from this picture, you can see visual diagnosis is really not reliable. If you are not sure, then you have to do more kind of like the symptoms, the, the diagnostic features that I told you is to look under the bark. In this case, you have to remove the plant, look at if there is any sloughing off of the roots going on and all that. So this is very, very important because, and I still believe that it's not a new disease. It's been uh, in the landscape of the nursery industry for a long time, but it was misdiagnosed as Phytophthora root rot. So the top one is Phytophthora root rot and the bottom one is boxwood dye bag. Now, if you want to look more into details with the, with the boxwood Phytophthora root rot, you will see that box sloughing off at the bottom, at the soil line, at the crown. And this discoloration is very dull brown, okay? This is just the, the decay of the, of the woody tissue and the xylem vessels. And you will see this all around it, okay? Uh, but this discoloration is totally different from what you see with the boxwood uh, dieback discoloration up in the canopy, or even in the crown area when you see it, uh, those pl the plants that I just showed you before. But that discoloration is totally, totally different. That was I call it a bright black discoloration. This is dull black discoloration. Obviously, with Phytophthora root rot, you don't see any root ball because it is a root rot pathogen and it will um, rot out the roots and then the sloughing off of the roots. I believe you are familiar with sloughing off of the roots the epidermis of the roots um, um, slough off and you end up having a na naked cortex of the root. Uh, it's like a red tail, okay, symptoms. Um, again, uh, this is totally different from what you see in the boxwood dieback. Boxwood dieback doesn't cause any rotting of the roots. Even the plants that I just showed you that we, we took them to the lab, the roots were still okay, they were not rotting. And if you know the root rot will cause um, radish lesions on some of the feeder roots, and here is an indication. You see a lesion right there, and you see a lesion at the tip. Here is another lesion. And if you're lucky enough, you can actually see the mycelium, the Phytophthora mycelium growing in the roots. Um, and this picture was actually taken with the camera, not with the microscope. So uh, this can be visible uh, if you are lucky enough. This is a current known distribution in the US. The bright yellow are confirmed states. The orange, they are suspected. Uh, but I have talked to some of the extension specialists like in Tennessee, Dr. Alan Windham, and 
he during our conversation we we discussed all those symptoms and and he kind of uh, agreed to me that yes they have those symptoms in Tennessee so it's just getting a matter of sample from the from from Tennessee just to make sure that we have it and I know we have it in Arkansas and Mississippi um, I don't see how it jumped from from any of those states but we are still trying to get samples from these states but if you look it's kind of all over the east coast and the gulf coast and i have a report from california but we haven't seen the sample yet that it's producing similar kind of symptoms uh, in california so the disease is spreading the disease is spreading uh, at an alarming rate and now is the time that we have to take care of it before the all all this man becomes uh, bright yellow uh, it is very concerning to the boxwood industry especially in louisiana we have several nurseries that are specializing in boxwoods they some of them propagate their own materials some of them got their liners from outside the state or from other nurseries and if if this disease is already circulating in the plant material then it's very tough to control or manage and another thing is that onset of the symptoms are delayed okay there's an incubation period so even if the the liners look healthy at a time by you by the time you brought them to your nursery and you start propagating or you start bringing them to um, trans uh, potting them in the new parts you may start seeing the disease symptoms so it's very very important that if we see the disease we need to keep a track of it outside the united states i was in czech republic um 2018 uh, year 2018 i was in czech republic and i went to uh, visit prague um, over the weekend and boxwoods in europe are all over the place okay they i think they they are pioneers in boxwood um, and this was the main town center in prague where I see the boxwood with very similar kind of symptoms. Okay, I was a tourist there and I didn't want to <laughs> look odd um, and looking at the boxwoods and being on my knees and looking at some of the boxwood with the knife in my pocket. Um, but um, they don't have a good horticulture program with with uh, Brno, uh, Mendel University in Brno. But I'm sure that they have the the dieback symptoms over there. Well, I was planning to go to Czech Republic this year again uh, to Mendel University on another project, Boxwood project. So I was trying to see if we can get samples from them or something like that. Uh, but I believe it's not just in the United States where our boxwoods are grown, the disease is present. Um, but somehow, I don't know, I've been trying to promote this disease. Like I'm a plant pathologist, so I say I promote this disease by saying promoting, I want to make sure that everybody knows about this disease. Um, one of the reasons I'm trying to put this information out there more and more is when I talk to um, my state plant health regulatory person and when they talk to other states, they are not aware of this disease. They are aware of the boxwood blight, they are aware of volatile blight, they are aware of minor diseases like macrophoma blight, but they are not aware of this boxwood dieback. And uh, in addition to that, it took me about four years to convince my peers to convince them that this is a this is a disease very different from Phytophthora, uh, but now we have the evidence. We know it is there. It's spreading at an alarming rate. So I think now is the time to actually look into this disease and maybe do some more research on it. Um, I I um, recruited a student back in 2018, fall of 2018. And uh, her main objective was to develop a diagnostic method. Um, that means we don't have to culture it out. Um, and uh, you can get a rapid response from, from, the, from the testing. Um, so she was able to develop a real-time TACMAN assay. Uh, in simple terms is that it is so specific that it will only test boxwood dieback from, off, from boxwoods. Uh, in the gel picture on the top, you see one DNA amplification in lane two, and then you don't see any other amplification in lane three to, three to eight. Three was um, Theobromicola, Caltartricum Theobromicola, same species from uh, cacao, and then we had one from uh, coffee, okay? Um, it didn't, I didn't amplify that 
Theobromicola too. And then we have some uh, other Caltotricum closely related species like Gliosporides or Acutatum or other things uh, that you can find on these plants and didn't amplify any of those. So again, this was just a preliminary assay to see if it finds that our Caltotricum is there and it was able to do that, but that was not our goal. Our goal is to give you a diagnostic method which can be very rapid and you don't have to wait for three, four days or a week to get those results. So once we did that, we, she was able to develop a real-time PCR assay where we can take the tissue directly from the plant material. You don't even have to culture it out. You just take a plant material from the suspected area where you start seeing the discoloration the only thing is you have to use the, the bark of that. You can't use the woody tissue. So once you use the bark tissue, you extract the DNA, which is if you do 12 DNA extraction, that's about two hours. Uh, and then you run this PCR, this is about half an hour. So once you have the DNA and master mix and everything, it takes about three to four hours to get you the results. And these are very accurate results. We are very confident actually, we are in the final phase of publishing this research. Um, we have submitted an abstract um, a, a year before last year, or last year she presented at the APS meeting, but this is something uh, that is very um, productive, that is a diagnostic method, a very reliable diagnostic method that the nursery growers, especially who are propagating their own material, and if they're suspecting any of their mother plants having these symptoms, they can definitely use, send those samples to the state diagnostic, the university diagnostic lab, and then the university diagnostic lab will follow this method and confirm if it is present or not. Uh, it's a very, I would say, uh, practical uh, method that we have developed. Again, uh, once the lab receives the, the plant material within like same day, you can get the results. In addition to that, uh, I've been asked this question, I don't know how many times, um, from landscapers, from nurseries, uh, from re research uh, uh, persons, from extension specialists, that what fungicides, okay? So this is a list of fungicides that we think are going to work against uh, our pathogen. Now this is in vitro fungicide screening. In vitro is that we are doing a, a lab assay. There is no competition from any other a microorganisms in the soil, this is pure, okay? So you may not see similar results when you go to the, the um, when you apply it in the landscape or apply it in the, in the nursery setting. So there might be a little bit of um, uh, efficacy uh, adjustment, but in this case, uh, we tested nine fungicides and these fungicides, they were, uh, shortlisted from a poster developed by Syngenta and Chase um, organization. They put together some efficacy data out of uh, on that poster where they have uh, fungicides that were um, effective against Caltotricum species in general. So uh, we had to start somewhere because we didn't know anything about this disease three, four years ago. So it was it's kind of all new for us. So we selected nine uh, fungicides that had very good to excellent efficacy uh, against the Caltotricum species in general, okay? Uh, so we tested them uh, and you can see the bottom two on our Camelot, which has copper octane as active ingredient at thousand parts per million, which is the higher concentration we test. It was zero inhibition in the mycelial growth and same with the diethane Rain Shield 75D Mencozab, uh, which again at 1000 ppm zero control or zero inhibition. So another thing that you can uh, interpret from this uh, table is that both copper octane and Mencozab, they are contact fungicides. And the top seven, uh, they, are, um, they are systemic insecticide. So this tells us that if you are spraying any any contact uh, fungicides on your in the nursery or in the landscape that might not be a good idea. So you may have to have preventative or pre-application when you're trying to um, propagate. You may have to do some of these uh, pre-mix 
uh, potting mix application or as a trench to your plants in order to prevent it from happening. Um, all the first all the first four, they are very good with the very they have really good efficacy. Uh, at one part per million, they were able to reduce the the mycelial growth by fifty percent. Um, and when you go to a little higher concentration on these uh, on the first four, um, you get more uh, up to eighty nine percent in mural orchestric intrinsic and pageant intrinsic. Um, Posteva is not out in the market. This was more kind of a research uh, sample that we received. It's a Syngenta project product. They are still working on the efficacy studies. So if once this becomes available, uh, Posteva at 10 ppm, uh, there was zero growth uh, in, the, in the petri plate, zero growth at 10 ppm. So I'm really, um, look. I'm going to look at it if, uh, it, if this becomes available uh, sooner than later. Uh, because if you get a combination of one or two products, uh, like you, at, at this time we have four, uh, which one we have uh, active ingredient is oxystrobin, pyroclostrobin, those, those are your strobilins. There is definitely a different active ingredient that you can use in order to prevent any resistance against it. Um, so in this case, if you use Mural one time, and then you can go with the Postiva the next time, uh, something like that, because you don't want to use same active ingredient here and here, okay? So, but this gives you an option on what you want to do uh, if you are in a nursery setting, and uh, if you have to do a pre-planting trench um, or apply this, these medium, these fungicides within the potting mix, like you do with algae, or, uh, or subdue for your phytophthora rural management. So this can be done in the same way. Um, you have thiophen and methyl 2613. Um, I like this product. Um, zero resistant to this fungicide so far. Um, and then you have concert to propaganazole clothalno. So even though they don't have like um, concert to at 25 ppm, it went up to like 80% inhibition. So you still, out of these seven, you still have a lot of products that you can alternately rotate with in order to prevent the fungicide resistant um, against this patho pathogen. Next step is that we, we did this study with the one isolate that was from Louisiana, original isolate from Louisiana. Now we are trying to screen all the isolates that we have from Louisiana and all of the states that we have isolates from to to do the study and see if any of those isolates are already resistant to any of these fungicides. I hope not, but we have to have that data in order to publish uh, this as a scientific publication. But if you try to use this, make sure uh, these fungicides are registered with your, uh, with your pesticide division, with your state department of agriculture. Uh, if you're not sure, then you can call them and make sure that you find it out. Uh, because I don't want to recommend something which is not listed or registered in your state and you illegally use it on your product. I don't want you to put in any kind of legal litigation um, problems. Okay, so um, you are welcome to use this information, but again, make sure that that trade name or the active ingredient is registered for use on boxwoods in the nursery as well as in the landscape or either way, whichever you want to do. Uh, some of the fungicides, they are uh, registered for the landscape and not for the nursery, and some are registered for the nursery and not in the landscape with similar kind of trade names and similar active ingredients. So just make sure that you follow the label. So um, now I, I want to talk about box for dieback management. And this is, I focused mainly on the, uh, mainly on the nursery uh, boxwood management, but dieback management. Um, the landscape management will have similar steps, but it will, it will, it will include some other cultural practices uh, that you want to take care of while you're planting them in the landscape. But so to start with, if you are a nursery owner or nursery grower and you are getting 
boxwood material as liners from outside, or even you're propagating material from outside, I would definitely recommend that you place them in isolation for about four to six weeks if you're getting them from, the, from an outside source. This is very important because we already know that the disease, the pathogen, it takes about 11 weeks for those typical symptoms to develop. We know the symptoms start developing way before that, but if you're not, if you're not familiar, if you haven't seen them before, you can easily miss it. And if you miss it, then the chances are that your entire block may get infected with that pathogen. So isolate the plant material outside, plant, especially outside plant material for about four to six weeks. And also when you're working with an outside material in your, in your nursery area, you may want to go to it at the end of the day. You don't want to start with your isolated material in the morning, okay? Uh, educate your crew members that uh, once they're done with your main blocks or the main nursery, then you go to this isolated area and then you work whatever you want to do with that. Water it, prune it or something like that. Make sure you do that end of the day before and do not go back in your main production area after that. Because sometimes uh, you forget and you can bring in a contaminated tool from that isolated area and then you can use the same tool next day to in your main production area and that can cross contaminate your material. If you are trying to, if you're propagating your own uh, boxwood from your mother plants, make sure that your mother plants is disease free, okay? Any kind of symptoms on that, um, you don't want to use it because again, we know this is a systemic disease. Even if it's not producing the symptoms, you may transfer that uh, infection from your mother plant to your liners and uh, once it's in the liners, it may take again six to 12 weeks to produce those symptoms. And by the time you see it, your, all your propagating material might get infected. Uh, in the propagation area, make sure the area is clean. It's clean out of any plant material uh, and also the tools, okay? Um, right now, I'm recommending that if you use bleach, 20% uh, bleach to surface disinfest, you can use pine salt. Uh, I said surface disinfectants, you can use uh, denatured alcohol to pr uh, clean up your tools. Uh, you can use a quaternary ammonia to disinfest your tools, but just make sure that you clean, the, you keep them clean. Any kind of uh, plant material they come in contact with has a potential to spread this pathogen. Um, the next step is very, very important because these diseases are totally different from each other, okay? especially Phytophthora root rot. Phytophthora root rot is not a fungal disease. It is a water mold. It's not a true fungi, okay? So the cultural practices and the chemical practices that you're going to implement towards Phytophthora root rot are, to are not going to work for your boxwood dieback management, okay? And we know this uh, from uh, experience um, where landscapers were treating them as Phytophthora and it didn't, it didn't do any, anything in the landscape. So um, subdue, uh, alliate, mephinoxum, they are not going to work against your box for dieback. Uh, but accurate identification is, is important because again, if it's in the liners, it's going to go into your production blocks. And once in the production blocks, it will go to the landscapes. And if we're trying to man manage this disease in the landscape, uh, this will be the first step that we can stop this disease from spreading at the nurseries. If the nurseries are cleaner, if they are producing cleaner material, then they can provide cleaner material to the landscapers. And that's how we can uh, battle this disease in the landscape. Once it's in the landscape, it's out of your hands because you, you can't either you remove all the plant material from that stock or you just keep on removing whenever it starts to, especially in a homeowner setting where you don't have all, where you, where you cannot apply all these chemicals. So those chemicals are mainly for the nursery industry right now. Um, I would definitely recommend that you scout your uh, blocks on a regular basis. You don't want to do it every day or twice a week, once in a, once a week, maybe on a Monday when you are fresh. And I know it's Monday for us, it, Saturday and Sunday is a long weekend, but for you growers, there is no weekend. So I know you, but fix a day when you're going to just look for that symptoms, okay? 
uh, definitely you're going to look at not just the, those symptoms, you're going to look at anything suspicious, but definitely pick a day where you're going to say, I'm going to, today I'm just going to scout for boxwood dieback. Then you can concentrate on what symptoms you are looking at. Once you see a suspected plant, even if it's not producing those tan colored foliage, if it's off colored foliage, you want to immediately remove that plant from your block. I would definitely recommend that if you can remove all the plants, one plant from each side from that block, that will give you a little more security that if the disease was there, and you might be able to uh, stop it from spreading. If you have a suspected plant or a symptomatic plant, uh, don't put in your cull piles because again, we have an evidence that um, the stumps may have may carry this disease. Uh, and if somehow the water from your cull piles uh, goes into your blocks or something like that, there is a chance that it can recontaminate it. Uh, any kind of uh, unnecessary injury to the plant material will stress out your plants. And I know from my experience that plant diseases or plant pathogens, they like stressed out plants. If the plants are happy and healthy and they're growing vigorously, they, the pathogens have a lesser chance to cause infection because plants defense mechanism can fight against it and it has a good probability that it will survive that uh, infection. But if there is unnecessary stress to the plants, unnecessary entry to the plants. Now this, this pathogen can enter the plant system on its own, but if you are providing it an entry, they, they will take it. Um, they won't say no to that entry and they will, there will be more infection. And we have seen it in one of the settings where we see a lot of the pathogen uh, multiplying on the terminal ends of newly, newly um, the boxwoods that were planted and pruned, and we can see the, the pathogen was concentrated in the terminal ends. And it was profusely sporulating on those terminal ends. So that is one indication that any kind of unnecessary injury will help the pathogen spread and develop much more faster. Do not reuse the potting mix. This is the potting mix I'm talking about. If you have a, if you have a three gallon pot and you started a uh, new liner in that and you start seeing the symptoms uh, and you want to just remove the liner and reuse the potting mix. I know it's just extra expense, but if you, you we, we are not sure if it stays in the soil, but to just to be on the safe side is a good precaution that any plant material, any, any, any parts that have, uh, that have um, Symptomatic plants of any disease, you don't want to use that potting mix, uh, don't want to reuse it. You can still reuse the pots, but make sure you uh, disinfest them, clean them properly, disinfest them. Uh, bleach is a good solution you can use, but if you use the bleach as a disinfestant solution, make, you, make sure you use, make sure you make fresh every time you disinfest it. You don't want to use a week old bleach mix uh, to disinfest because it may not work. It degrades much more faster. Um, irrigation methods, drip irrigation um, is, uh, is the most uh, effic effic I would say effective method in managing these diseases because it does not wet the foliage. It does not splash the spores out of the infected plant material compared to your overhead irrigation. Um, so drip irrigation, I would recommend drip irrigation. And I know some of your nursery growers, they are already on the drip irrigation, which is the best way to manage these diseases. And again, um, this disease, they, it requires high humidity and high temperature in order to cause the disease. Not a lot of high temperature. We have seen it in like uh, winter months where it produces symptoms, but uh, high humidity is required for this pathogen to um, germinate and inoculate and cause the infection process. When you're pruning, uh, even if you're maintaining some of your plants in the, in the nursery setting, and I know you do some, some cleaning pruning uh, with those plants, I would recommend that make sure that the pruning tools, the, uh, even the electric or the gas powered, they, they are sharp, they make a sharp cut. Um, if you don't make a sharp cut, then uh, there is a, that makes it like a bigger injury or bigger wound than the, compared to a sharp tool, sharp cut. That gives another opportunity for the pathogen to move into the plant system. Disinfest pruning tools frequently. Okay? 
very very important i know sometimes it's really hard to go back to and and disinfest it uh, what you can do is you can use multiple pruning um, uh, multiple pruning tools and you can have a bucket full of bleach uh, solution 20 percent bleach solution and you can dip some and use some and then you can save some time on the disinfestation process but disinfesting it every uh, two to three or five plants is is recommended um, i just gave you a list of fungicides uh, preventative fungicide applications uh, <laughs> The idea here is again, we are going to test, uh, do some more tests and see which path, which isolates are uh, maybe resistant or no resistant or something like that. Uh, but we're going to give you more information on those fungicides. Just make sure that the active ingredient or the brand name that you're going to use for this disease is registered for nursery uh, production, okay? The label should tell you if it is if there are any agriculture restrictions on that label, and make sure it's registered for the for for the uh, for that state. I know you are all professionals. You've been growing um, plants for a long, long time, and I know you take care of all these things. But it's just uh, refreshing that uh, I have seen seen some growers they can buy anything, or anybody can buy anything from Amazon.com. So it's very, very important that you look at the label before um, you start uh, ordering those uh, fungicides. Again, one of the fungicide positiva is not still in the market. Uh, I'm going to talk to the, uh, the Syngenta rep and see when it's going to become available. And I'm going to put that information in, in future uh, presentations. Um, so far, it's kind of unfortunate that we tested with so far we have we know it go, definitely goes to english korean japanese and um and your uh, baby gems okay um we are right now testing about seven hybrids of boxwood in the greenhouse and um the data doesn't look good okay it's kind of unfortunate but most of the the hybrids and those are the hybrids that are not even released that we are testing and uh, the results, we are already seeing some symptoms and some of the cultivars. Um, unfortunately, this is what it is. Uh, we can't do anything with it. It's a systemic um, fungus and it's very difficult to develop any resistant uh, in those cultivars. Um, but that's another a PhD project or something like that. I don't want to put too much pressure on my graduate student and I don't want her to run away <laughs> Uh, after learning about this is, but she's very good at it and she's doing as much as she can. Well, with this COVID-19 situation, we are halted on all aspects of research and extension. We are under a stay home order till April 30th. And our governor has just released the news that schools are no longer going to go in the session for this academic year. So I don't know how it's going to go with, the, the, with LSU. Uh, I can still go to the lab where we are um, advised not to do that. Um, and, and as a citizen of Louisiana, I don't want to spread the disease or get infected or anything like that. But we definitely know how to do the, uh, we already have done the inoculations in the greenhouse uh, for those uh, seven hybrids. All we have to do is take data from them um, and, and publish that too. Uh, but those results don't look promising. None of those hybrids are resistant to, to boxwood dieback so far. And uh, I guess that is all I have. And this is my information. Um, I definitely recommend, you, you are most more than welcome to contact me anytime, uh, myself through my email, but I would recommend that you go uh, through Ms. Jones because that way she will have, a, she, will, she can track what nurseries uh, in, especially in North Carolina, they are seeing this problem and how to manage the problem at the state level and then at the national level. But again, if you have any questions or anything like that, uh, I will be more than happy to uh, reply later at a later date or anything like that. Uh, but use my email to communicate with me. Cell phones, if I see a number which I don't recognize, I don't pick it up. I know that's not a good thing, but um, Email, email me, I'm, I'm very good with the email, replying with the email. But again, uh, keep Ms. Jones in the loop and um, let 
go through her and, and she can provide uh, more information to other growers as well, not just uh, the one who is asking questions. So again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to talk to Ms. Jones and I would be happy to chip in any time, um, any later date uh, to answer you more about these questions. Thank you.